Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Wilkes, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Gordon White Building and to UT Austin's John L. Warfield Center for African and African American Studies. I have the honor of directing the center, and I'm also an associate professor of English, Black Studies, and Comparative Literature here at UT. Before continuing, I want to acknowledge that those of us in North America are on the indigenous lands of Turtle Island, the ancestral name for what is now called North America. Moreover, I would like to acknowledge the Alabama Cushada, Caro, Carrizo Come Crudo, Kualuitecan, Comanche, Kickapoo, Lipan Apache, Tonkawa, and Isleta del Sur Pueblo, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become a part of these lands and territories in Texas. Following the lead of the Retelling Central Texas History Team, I ask that we also remember the struggles and legacies of Tejano, Black, Asian, and other peoples who have created this space within the context of ongoing dispossession and cultural violence. One more note of gratitude, and there's never enough uh, gratitude, in my opinion. Please join me in thanking Warfield Center Senior Program Coordinator Christina Bryant and Graduate Assistant Chelsea Okorafor for their work in planning and promoting this event. So today, the Warfield Center is hosting our first in-person duets, Black Creatives in Conversation, since fall 2019. Our featured guest for this return is K.B. Brookins, a poet, essayist, and cultural worker from Texas. They are the author of How to Identify Yourself with a Wound, Callisto Gaia Press 2022, Freedom House, forthcoming from Deep Vellum Publishing, and Pretty, forthcoming from Alfred A. Knopf. They are also an MFA candidate with the New Writers Project here at UT Austin. So KB and I are going to dialogue um, for a bit, um, maybe 25 to, to 30 minutes. Um, and then we're going to open the floor um, for questions um, and comments. So please, um, I'm sure you're, you're all all will be thinking and listening actively. If you're joining us online, um, please share your questions. Um, and when we get to the Q&A portion, I will pick up my phone so I can access your, your questions and make sure that everyone is included in the conversation. So KB, thank you so much for coming uh, to uh, take part in duets. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, I've really enjoyed um, reading and sitting with your work um, over these last few weeks. And so um, I have um, some questions about form, about the craft of, of poetry, um, some questions about place um, in general, but in particular, Texas. Um, you note that you're from Texas in your um, bio, right? And Texas figures in many of your poems. Um, and then I thought we might um, close by talking about the many different types of, of work that you do. So poet, cultural worker, essayist, right? And how those relate to each other and how you negotiate them. So, um, so first with form, um, can you talk a bit about what draws you to or interests you about working within and perhaps against um, certain um, poetic forms? I um, have some pieces in mind, but I want to start with that sort of uh, broad question um, uh, to start things off. Yeah. Um, well, every poem technically has a form, right? When it comes to you, the form can be oratory. I feel like I hear an echo, but um, the form can be oratory or it can be like, on a page, right? Um, so with that being said, I think a lot when I think about form, about what experience I want the reader to have, because it's one thing to write a poem and it's another thing to share it publicly. Um, so when it hits that kind of public sphere, um, what control do I want to have and what control do I want to relinquish kind of thing? So if the control I want to have is like, okay, I want you to read it in this particular pace, 
then, okay, I'm thinking about stanzas. I'm thinking about sentence structure. I'm thinking about, okay, where do I need to cut the line? Mm -hmm. um, or where do I need to like disrupt a sentence? So like what helps me a lot with like figuring out a form is thinking about history, right? Mm -hmm. um, luckily, I'm not the first person to ever write a poem, right? So I have like years and years and thousands of years of history to rely on. Mm -hmm. um, so I think about traditional forms, say like the sonnet or the villanelle, and those have their purpose. Um, and what am I trying to say um, politically, sonically, emotionally, mm -hmm. right? And what form fits that kind of saying? So. What I usually do, right, and this changes as the days change, but right now at least I'm kind of excavating what I need to say, kind of like birthing something, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then I read it out loud. And like, where do I naturally pause? Where, what kind of pacing do I have? Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like the words are water and the form is like a container. So then it's kind of like a retroactive process but sometimes I also sit down and I'm like, I am going to write a sonnet, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that already gives me the contain the t container of like, okay, it's got to be 14 lines. It got it has to have a turn at the end, mm -hmm. unless I'm writing some other kind of like sonnet, like an American sonnet, where it's like, okay, everything goes, but it still has to more or less be 14 lines, mm -hmm. right? So, form I think is just about finding a body for the words mm -hmm. for me. Thank you. So, um, so you talked a bit about um, how you want the audience to receive the work, and then you also talked about um, disruption um, just now. And so that makes me think of um, the poems and how to how to identify yourself with a wound um, that you strike through. Um, and so. Can you talk? Um, I, I'd love to hear you say more about your use of um, strike through, um, so self portrait as Pangea, and uh, upon hearing the news about, um, and followed by a series of names, Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, which are struck through, um, your use of that um, technique. Um, and do you read those, do you read those poems out loud when you do readings? And if so, how do you approach that? Right, right. So strike through is like, a, a thing old as time, really, in poems. And I think it serves different purposes depending on the poem. So like self-portrait as Pangea, for anyone that doesn't know, it's kind of me um, saying the quiet parts out loud. And that's how I use strike through in this particular poem, right? So if you flip through it, LOL, what page is it on? Um, <laughs> I was very so, English professor and wrote down the page numbers. <laughs> so it's page nine. Yeah, so it's this part. Um, that fitting wasn't working for them, me, and came up with a wound, a promise, a solution, and a wound, a promise is striked out, and them is striked out. So in this particular poem, um, I believe strike through to be working as a, I'm telling you something that you shouldn't know, but obviously as a reader, you're going to get to know it all anyway, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and also sometimes the thoughts we have are not our thoughts if that makes sense. Um, like, they are thoughts that are so deeply implanted that we don't always see them, so we strike through them in our minds. Mm -hmm. So, like, in our minds, we may be like, okay, I believe that, you know, this particular thing about abortion, for example. And that may be not even your original thought. It just may be something that was told to you once or something that your family thinks, so therefore you think it, right? Or something that even an instructor told you, so therefore you think it. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of this strike throughs in this particular poem as like a, I'm showing you what's actually happening in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and also a poem, a poet is always just searching, right? Searching for what language like fits the experience. So in that searching, I actually might, you know, first think it's a wound, and then second, I think it's a promise, but like what I actually meant to say was a solution, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like you're seeing in real time my writing process also, okay. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then in another poem, uh, so that strike through, um, and you also note that the strike through is only in the title, right? Mm -hmm. The whole title is Upon Hearing the News About Tony McDade, um, Laylene. Polanco, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Mike Ramos, right? Um, it really could be a stand-in for any name, 
right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, those are people that have full lives um, that were taken for ridiculous reasons. Mm -hmm. And the hashtags are endless at this point. So this could be upon hearing the news about anything. I don't know about y'all, but I've woken up to Twitter um, a couple of days and been like, shit. You know, especially in like 2020, which is around the time I was um, mm -hmm. finishing the last couple of poems okay. in this collection. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, before you even wake up and brush your teeth, you're like subjected to violence kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to have a flip through of like what that experience is. Um, and I honestly think, and this is maybe um, a problematic opinion, but like, I don't think we were really meant to ingest that much information, especially like trauma, right? Mm -hmm. So like, if we're not supposed to ingest that, but we've already ingested it and we have to go about our day and do stuff like, you know, defog your glasses, one thing I said in that poem, mm -hmm. it just, it has a whole new wash because you've already seen something that's really messed up. Right. And that's, mm -hmm. even if you ignore it, is gonna cloud throughout your entire day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I don't think your opinion is controversial <laughs> at all. And in fact, I have um, my, colleague Heather Hauser in English has written about what she calls infowhelm. Mm -hmm. So you're overwhelmed yeah. by information and um, information, information always serves multiple purposes, but as you were referencing and um, you know, talking about seeing things on Twitter when you wake up, um, there's conveying um, news, facts, occurrences, but there's also the replication through representation of violence, right? Um, and there is something about going on these social media platforms and seeing the hashtags, the, the headlines, the videos, right? Mm -hmm. In many cases, um, that, is, um, that is overwhelming. And then as um, your poem signifies, like how can you incorporate the incomprehensible, right? Um, I'm thinking, for a weird reason, I'm thinking of the, uh, the, the French word um, insupportable, which is like you just can't take something into needing to clean your glasses and go to work and, and buy gas. Like it, it should not be compatible, right, with anyone's daily existence. And so I think that the poem um, demonstrates that. So thank you for, for sharing more about um, your process. So another poetic form that is perhaps as old as time is the poetic cycle. Um, and so um, if you have read How to Identify Yourself with a Wound, um, you'll note that there are five um, poems that share the title of the collection and they're distinguished Yes, by their, their content and form, but also by different date markers. So the years 2007, 2012, 2016, 2018, and 2020. Um, so did that start off as a cycle? Did it become a cycle as you were writing and realize, oh, these poems are resonating with each other? You know, can you tell us a bit about um, uh, the the poems that um, directly connect to the title of the collection, please. Yeah, it's so funny, like, when we see something that is the same title, it's just all this emphasis. So it's like a mm -hmm. lot of pressure, um, obviously, to come up with that. But mm -hmm. it was a really intuitive thing for me. So like, I went to an event like y'all are at right now um, with Irene Lara Silva, who is okay. the judge of this mm -hmm. um, prize. Mm -hmm. um, and someone was asking her a question about race, like, inevitably with uh, writers of color, people are like, what does it mean to be a Latinx writer or a black writer? I'm just like, you are not asking fucking John Ashbery, what does it mean to be a white writer? Like, you know, he's dead, but you know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> you're not asking those questions. So someone was asking a kind of question like that. Mm -hmm. And she is just like, you know, so when you identify yourself with a wound, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And that phrase was just really mm -hmm. interesting to me. And it like unearthed the kind of like obsession with this idea of race being a wound, quote unquote. Um, and then I thought like, oh, that's not the only thing going on in my particular narrative. Cause it's like these ways of, uh, I mean, and when you read the poems, they're like snapshots of instances of homophobia or transphobia or racism, mm -hmm. where it's like, 
So in those moments, it was told to me that who I am is not what I need to be. Mm -hmm. um, but in those moments, I was still present. I was still in my body and I was still who I am today and who I was in that moment, mm -hmm. right? So it's me like identifying myself despite whoever, you know, the opposing forces seeing it as like a wound, mm -hmm. seeing it as something like I need to absolve in mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. um, so these poems have snapshots, like you said, 2007, um, 2016, 2020. Um, <laughs> They honestly just coincided with different like like moments, like when those moments actually happened. Okay. But also, okay. I feel like like core crises, like in my kind of identity forming. Mm -hmm. um, LOL, I'm about to date myself. But in 2007, I was in middle school, right? <laughs> um, that was the you know uh, 808s and heartbreaks era. Um, that was you know everyone's wearing these weird studded belts. Um, <laughs> everyone's listening to Paramore, which is resurging now. Yeah. It's so mm -hmm. funny um, to see that. But yeah, so it was that, that moment of time where like I was just clearly like angsty and didn't fit in kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to channel that in that poem. And um, in 2016, I think that was my like, LOL, what is gender kind of moment? Cause I was like, okay, uh, womanhood has always been denied to me. Um, it's, it's often denied to black women, right? It's mm -hmm. often denied to uh, fat women. It's often denied to people that are, you know, anything not small, petite, and white, right? Um, mm -hmm. And cis. Right. Um, so I was just like, well, I'm not any of those things. And also, even if I was any of those things, like my body, my being resists that. Right. right. So like, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's just like different crises, like a gender crisis, like me finding out I'm black. Right. Um, which like I went to an all black middle school, all black high school. So then going to college, I'm just like, dang, like there's a lot of white people here. bro. <laughs> Who am I? Like, what does it mean to be black? What, what happens when people perceive you as black? Because right. my, you know, people I grew up with just perceived me as gay mostly um <laughs> so i'm like okay now i'm being uh before anything before i even open my mouth i'm right. being perceived mm -hmm. as black and like what is that experience um and in 2020 it's kind of where i finally felt like like at home in my body kind of thing um i was just like okay this is who i am this is this is what i am and like luckily um, started experiencing like love for the first time. Mm -hmm. And by love, I mean like self-love, but also love of another person that is not so like withholding. Um, mm -hmm. I'm engaged now, it's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, so, so really those poems just served as like snapshots of different times mm -hmm. in my life. Mm -hmm. It's snapshots of those moments where the wound almost like uh, jutted out. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So then would it be fair, um, I'm going to do my literary critic thing here mm. and try to extend what's going on in your work. Um, could one way of like rereading the title be how to identify yourself with who you are? Mm. Because you're um, embracing that even as these opposing forces, as mm -hmm. you said, um, are trying to deny that or correct it. Um, mm just basically not accept it, is mm -hmm. that, yeah? Absolutely, yeah, I think it's like, so these are experiences I had to heal from, right? Like these are experiences yeah. where I had to like unlearn what was kind of being force fed. Yeah. So in that way, it, it almost felt like a wounding moment, but absolutely, it's just like at the end of the day, like who I am, okay. who a mm -hmm. lot of people are, right. you know? And it's really, um, I'm really grateful, you know, that this book is out because then other people can read it and be like, oh, I've, I've also felt this way, or like, I've also been in this scenario, because so many of us, despite, you know, the progress that we say that we've made, like, mm -hmm. so many black queer kids are still being told that they're, you know, doing something wrong by just existing, right? Mm -hmm. So many um, black trans kids are being denied, like, or so many trans people in general, especially in Texas. I'm gonna look at the camera when I say this. Especially in Texas, are being denied their personhood, you know. So I think it's really important for me to say these things and and put these things out there. And you know, maybe the title is a little misleading because it's like, okay, you know, by the time by the by the time the end comes here, it's like, be who you are. 
you know. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but yeah. I would say um, misleading, but it is leading, and it helps us as readers follow you on that journey. Um, mm -hmm. So no, I, I, I love the, the title. Mm -hmm. um, so Texas. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead and shift, and I'll look at the camera in Texas, um, <laughs> and, and talk a bit about place. And in particular, I'm interested in how you write about um, Fort Worth, um, where you're from, how you write about um, Austin, um, and you know maybe Texas writ large. And in terms of Texas as a whole, I'm thinking about um, Good Grief, which you published with the Academy of American Poets, which for those of you who may not know, Good Grief is about um, Winter Storm Uri in 2021 and the ways in which that devastated um, many, I'm just going to say all of our communities here in Texas. It was unevenly experienced, but in my 20 years in the state, I cannot recall any other event right that has had ripple effects um, across the state. So, um, yeah, so um, how does Texas figure into your work? Why does it, and in, you know, these particular places in Texas? Mm. Um, so I was, I was once told by a teacher, which I still think is true, like, um, don't try to be universal in your writing because being specific leads to understanding, mm -hmm. like more understanding and more depth. So, um, I can't escape my context, right? Like, mm -hmm. I've only ever lived in Texas. I'm a career Texan. I'm gonna be here, presumably, for the future. Um, and yeah, Fort Worth and like the place in which these events happened, I think was really important for me to name mm -hmm. because um, when I tell people I'm from Texas and I'm on these like, you know, stuffy calls and things like that, they always like feel bad for me. Like, for real. Yeah, yeah. When you tell a New Yorker, especially like a New Yorker in like literary America or like, you know, those big hugs, like you're from Texas, they're just like, oh, you poor thing. Um, and I'm just like, please don't do that, right? And like, if I have a mission as a writer is really to like infiltrate, you know, the larger narrative of Texas with like the people that are actually here because too many people know us for our politics, mm -hmm. um, our main, our like, you know, like really voter suppressed, really gerrymandered politics, and not like the actual day-to-day -day interactions that people have in Texas. So I think for that reason, it was really important for me to name place. And yeah, I mean, Austin, Texas has been in my home for about four years. Okay. So, and I've gotten to know people that are from here and have been here for a long time, and I think it was really important for me to name that. I mean, it was a part of my journey. Literally had to uh, more or less run away from my hometown in order to be myself at a point. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, um, then it makes sense for me, especially during the hashtag gender crisis, to uh, talk about how I kind of found that in Austin. But also not talk about Austin as a utopia, because it very much is not, right? Mm -hmm. um, we got our issues here too. Um, that I also want to continue to address as a writer, as a Texan writer, as a now Austinite, I guess I can say. Uh, it's been four years. But yeah, I think place, um, place contextualizes my work. Mm -hmm. And place, I think, is essential to the understanding of my work and the understanding of like Texas. You know, like when someone is not in Texas and they read this book, I want them to get a little glimpse into what Texan life is like, like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. I um, really appreciate how, so as another, as a fellow transplant um, to Austin, I appreciate how, so there is a poem entitled Transplant, uh, for those of you who haven't read the um, collection. Um, I appreciate how you navigate being a transplant thoughtfully, Right, um, attentively, so you're taking in um, Austin and being mindful of the histories and people that have preceded you here and that still live here and the ways in which the changes in the city are impacting those communities. Um, but that doesn't stop you from being critical in your, your mindfulness. Um, and so there's another um, uh, poem entitled Elon Musk is Moving uh, to Austin, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, very topical. And we 
could, but I do not recommend having an entire conversation about Elon Musk. <laughs> but you know, there are ways in which he is the perfect symbol for so many of the other changes, right, that are impacting the city and that are changing it in ways such that those older communities with deeper roots um, don't recognize it. And you know, even those of us who are transplants but have been here um, for a while no longer recognize aspects of, of the city too. So, um, so yeah, I, you're really thoughtful about that. Um, and I appreciate your representing against those coastal um, like groups or um, just sort of outside of Texas groups that want to collapse everybody here um, into a monolith because we are far from, from the monolith. So, um, so then let's maybe uh, conclude the conversation by talking about the multiple roles that you juggle, and then we'll um, open things up to discussion. Um, so we've been talking about your work as a poet, but that's just one of the things that you, you do. You're um, an essayist. You're a cultural worker. Um, so what is your sense of the rela relationship between those roles? and? Um, do they require negotiation or, or navigation? And here I'm thinking of um, students, um, undergraduates in particular, younger students who might be thinking about what they want to do after college and may have the perception that they have to follow a single track, right? And I think that your career is an excellent example of not having to limit yourself to, to one thing. So um, it would be great if you could talk more about that. Yeah, yeah, well, Definitely um, career path stuff. Uh, I'm one of those people that have worked like every job. Like I've worked in like a UPS. I've worked as a real retail person. I worked in food service. I worked in a marketing um, office, which I should not have been working there. I, am, <laughs> I know nothing about marketing. Um, I have made ends meet in a whole wide variety of things, mm -hmm. but the like constant heart and engine under it all was kind of poetry. Okay. Um, I started writing poetry when I was 15, and um, really just it's been wrestling with me since. Mm -hmm. um, it's mm -hmm. like the most consistent thing that's ever been in my life, like writing things down. And even before I wrote poetry, I like aggressively diaried. Like, maybe the only feminine coding thing that I've done all my life is, like, have a diary, like, have, like, you know, I even have entries of me being a seven-year-old and being like, why is life so hard? Like, it's ridiculous. Um, but it would be for some silly, like, I didn't get a popsicle. But, like, it's helpful. It's helpful context. Yeah. So, like, mm -hmm. I've always been a person that processes my emotions and processes like how my body is physically feeling through the writing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and like even processing like my values um, and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So after a certain time, I was just like, why am I continuing to try to be everything else instead of like what I actually am, which is a writer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and a like a, a organizer. So. Um, another one of my passions is like really bringing people together in a room and I just never want anybody to feel like how I felt in moments of my life where it's just like there's nobody else like me. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of my time, you know, in the, the various jobs I've been in is like finding people and being like we should go out sometime. And then that kind of evolved into having a reading series here in Austin for about two years mm -hmm. that I ran where it was just like all different kinds of artists, not even just writers, like musicians, comedians, visual artists, etc. like all kind of coalescing together. Um, and now these days I do cultural work, which to me is like merging the arts and this kind of like political consciousness together mm -hmm. um, as much as I can. I tell people to organize artfully, really, which means like there's never been a movement that didn't, that was like devoid of art. So for that reason, we need to be thinking about how to intentionally integrate art into um, all of our movement work. So like, okay, if we want um, to appeal to people emotionally, if we want to shift culture, like what better to do that than to like utilize art, right? I have a Telfar bag with me today. I would not have that if um, Beyonce um, <laughs> didn't talk about it in a song, you know, like 
people try to act like they're so like avant-garde and like don't listen to trends. And I'm like, yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> you do. Like, you would not be saying half the things you didn't say if it wasn't for you having a TikTok account. You know what I mean? So like, if we're going to, <laughs> if we're going to think about shifting culture around, say, like homophobia, transphobia, or like um, uh, disability justice, or like, you know, racial justice, I think we have to incorporate like, where is a, it's much easier. And I, I say this from personal experience. It's so much easier getting people to an open mic than it is to a political rally. Mm -hmm. It just mm -hmm. simply is. Yeah. People like to be entertained. People like to be enlightened. People like to hear what artists have to say, right? Um, it's both entertaining and informative, in my opinion, right? Um, and also, art galvanizes people into change. Um, these days, the galvanizing usually is like a marketing tactic for you to buy something, but like it can be galvanizing to like get you to like at art events, you know. I'm always like, okay, what else do we need to have? Like, do we need to have booths there so people can register to vote? Do we need to have like, you know, uh, said, you know, nonprofit come and like bring, you know, uh, pamphlets for people to read? Like, do we need to have zines that are both artistic and educational? Like, I'm really interested in always merging those things and always having like a political purpose behind the art that I personally make um, and always, uh, encouraging people like there's politics at play in your art even if you you know completely deny that right okay. um, I think about uh, this this uh, what do you call it protest that happened at Howard University where they were all singing a Rihanna song mm -hmm. it's like bitch better have my money and it was like at the registrar's office mm -hmm. because of like rising tuition and I'm like obviously Rihanna did not like ex she was not like I'm gonna be a political activist <laughs> you know, with this song but all of a sudden it's in a political space so it's just like think about those things think about mm -hmm. what you could be doing um, I think about Lizzo who I love um, who is uh, donating a portion of her proceeds for a tour to uh, I believe it's like abortion funds okay. So like things like that. So there's always something to be done. And, and with cultural work, I'm always just trying to like push that, push that agenda ahead. Um, so they all, they all talk to each other. What, I, I forgot to talk about essay writing. So like, um, there is very much a relationship to me between the poem and the essay. Because mm -hmm. the poem is kind of like, to me, this like canvas in which I can, I can really do anything mm -hmm. um, within the constraints of the page. In the essay, I think I turn to the poem when a sentence is gonna like fail me, hmm. if yeah, that makes sense, does. right? Like I can talk in a poem in sentences, but I can do things a bit more. Um, a poem incorporates more kind of elements like the line and the stanza and like illusion and like mm -hmm. it requests something different from a reader than say like an essay does. Mm -hmm. Even the lyric essay, as far as it can possibly go and be like so experimental, I think the poem just does, has a different kind of effect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trusting you more, I think, when I write poems. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. trusting you more to fill in some blanks. Yeah. Um, and with essays, I think, at least me as an essayist, it's like a bit more um, contained, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, KB. I don't want to, I could ask you more, but I don't want to uh, monopolize the time. So I'm going to open the floor um, to, uh, to wider discussion. So are there any questions um, for KB? And I'm going to grab my phone in case there are questions online. But OK, thanks. So we're going to bring the mic. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say how impressed I was um, listening, as I had an opportunity to listen on Amazon Music. There was some, there's something so beautiful about the experience of marginalized communities at the same time that it's impacted systemically by things that are so negative. And as you talked about loving your city, but almost hating to love your city, like, could you speak to some of the complexities that I feel that sometimes the status quo doesn't understand about loving something that also, um, pushes you to be more innovative, pushes a certain level of resilience 
that couldn't be had otherwise. Um, so even when I think about Queen Nikki Giovanni and she talks about when she dies, like she doesn't want them to write about her because they'll only remember her hard times, but they won't, they won't understand that even the things that I complained about made me who I am. Can you speak to that? Because I felt like there was this subtle nudge that like, I love the things that you won't understand. Yeah. I'm gonna answer that by like saying a story. So one time when I was growing up, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas on the east side. Um, I stayed right across the street from like a dope house, right? Um, they were just in there, in and out um, all day. And one day, me and my cousin, my family, like had this pretty big backyard for the time and we were just like playing outside. We were just on the swing and all of a sudden, you know, these undercover cops came and like, it's in the first poem, they came and like wrestled these people to the ground. Um, and me and my cousin, who was two years younger than me at the time, saw this happening, right? We just looked across the street and was like, oh, these people are like rolling around in the ground and there's dogs and it's a whole thing. And we just, we're having such a good time, like just playing on the swing and playing basketball. And it's like, I think when I think of your question, I think about the duality of both of those things. I think about how across the street, there's something terrible happening. And me and my cousin are just laughing, playing, having a great good old time. We had a time last night, us, you know, after the, you know, sleepover, just talking to each other. But it's that both of these things are happening at the same time. Like throughout all of our childhoods, we have, you know, these things that gave us joy as well as these things that need to be critiqued. And I love my city. I love my hometown enough to critique it. Like if I didn't love, it's just like with a friend, right? If you love somebody, you will tell them when they're violating you, right? So y'all's love can get deeper, right? Because love actually cuts off when you start being like dishonest and when you start being like, it stifles, it like tends to not grow. It's kind of like putting a, putting a damper or like putting a surface on top of, yeah, exactly. So like, I think I say these things and I like confess these things in the poem because I want things to get better. And I know they can get better. And also I have to relish in the good stuff because I don't want people to feel bad for me when I tell them I'm from Texas. Cause I'm just like, but y'all don't understand the trees are beautiful and y'all don't understand the people are great. And y'all don't understand the thing that's kept me here for 27 years is that I was able to find myself, you know? in the midst of all of this otherwise terrible stuff. I think about the, the poet Roske, right? He has this poem that is actually very devastating that people quote all of the time, um, no matter the pool towards the brink, you know? Um, and he's talking about these things that are otherwise like, really like, I really could have not been okay, but Man, my niece is like growing up and she's amazing. And, you know, there's a basketball game happening over here. Like, there are so many beautiful things that, and like, I also think that's the, that's the, what are, what are the words am I trying to find? That is like the black experience in America, right? Like, having all of this, these people trying to like push you down and make you into a mold, right? Capitalism, racism, et cetera. But we be having a good time, you know? <laughs> Regardless, we've created this culture from like stripping of culture, you know? Um, I am a person that is literally a direct descendant of slaves, right? And it's like enslaved people, I should say. And it's like, I wouldn't be able to even live the life that I live right now in my skin um, without that kind of resistance, without those moments of joy. So both have to exist. And if I am to give an honest depiction of any city in America, then both have to exist. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions?
Hi, KB. It's wonderful to see you again. Congratulations on the engagement. Um, my question is really wondering how you start these conversations, which I feel like is a conversation, a question that's asked like so much. But one of my research interests, for example, um, is going to southern uh, sundown towns and trying to see and meet queer and trans uh, black individuals in those sundown towns and see how their um, intersectional personalities impact their ability to thrive in these locations. And I guess with my biggest concern um, with that interest is that, you know, you talked about how um, being from your hometown, Fort Worth, I'm from Grand Prairie, so my dad lives in Fort Worth, and really just being able to um, find yourself in Austin, how do you begin to then locate people that are in such a suppressed and oppressed um, area like sundown towns? How did you begin to find people that match your identities in Fort Worth? How did you begin to find people that match your identities in your hometown? And really, how do you start those conversations? Yeah. Um, the thing about, the thing about black folks and the thing about like black queer people is I feel like we find each other like just kind of organically so like uh, I remember my first week of high school for example um, this girl literally just came up to me and started talking and she was just like blah 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 blah, blah. and I'm like oh okay cool and she was just like you my friend now right like she just made that decision and I was like cool I literally don't have any other options so um, <laughs> She became my friend, and then um, all of a sudden, you know, I wanted to hang out with her all the time. I was so excited to finally have friends, you know, and, and something like a friend group introduced me to all her friends, and then they all happened to go to this after-school thing called Poetry Society. And then I'm going, I'm seeing them read poems, and I'm like, that seems really um, scary. <laughs> like, I was just like, I don't know if I can do the poem thing, but I'm going to come here because I want to hang out with my friends. And, you know, eventually I start writing on my own. Um, turns out, like, uh, it's about to be my, like, 10-year high school reunion. We're all gay, you know? <laughs> and we didn't know that at the time. We didn't know that at the time. We didn't really talk about it at the time. I definitely, like, you know, was having all this internal turmoil um, of, like, uh, Something is different about me, and people are calling me gay. I don't even know what that is, blah, blah, blah. Um, so we just, we literally just found each other. And I think that's a survival tactic, because she had to look at me and be like, we are the same, right? Like, there's some about you, and there's some about me that is similar, right? So literally, just like out in the world, that's how that happened. That's how I got my first kind of group of like black queer friends. Um, and Shoot, when I first moved here, uh, I went to H-E-B and I was like the only black person and I have that in a poem too in this book. And I was like, oh no, this is not gonna work. So then I went on Facebook and was like, where are the black queer people? <laughs> um, and then I found stuff like Austin Black Pride. I found other organizations like All Go, which is really amazing. Um, I found all of these kind of small Facebook groups. Like I had to intentionally seek it out when I moved here. Um, and I mean, more power to you for that research because I think it's very much important, right? Like the black queer narrative can't just be like Northeast, right? It has to be like also these Southern experiences because we are here despite all of this, you know, political suppression and political oppression, like we are here. Um, and despite even in Austin, like, the black population, I mean, Austin is the only city, I think, that is growing, but the black population is, is decreasing. So it's like we're small in numbers, but we're still here. Um, I went to an Austin Black Pride event when I first moved here, and all of a sudden I felt like I was transported back to high school. Like it was only like, or maybe not only, but it was like majority black people and like majority black queer people and that just excited me so much like it just does something for you mentally to be around people you don't have to explain stuff to um so i mean really i think it's just actively seeking it out like people also want to find you you know what i mean like i'm never turning down new friends like new, i'm i'm 
despite what Drake says, I am not no new friends. Like, I love meeting other people that like have same mentality, have same experiences as me, um, and especially elders. Like, we really forget that like a whole subsection, especially of Black queer community, was really eviscerated during the AIDS crisis, and a lot of those people. Um, are not thought of when we're thinking about like black queer programming and black queer research even. Um, so I think they'd love to hear from you, honestly. Like you gotta probably just make the first connection and um, do the research thing, I guess. But like, I think it's good. I think it's awesome. I wanna read it, you know, when you, when you make it. Yeah, thank you. Check in with our friends online. If not, I have another question. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Uh, KB, where can we support you and find all of your stuff and like buy all of your things? Please tell me. Hello, that's my friend, y'all. Um, <laughs> so I'm online. Um, on Twitter until it falls apart, um, <laughs> on Instagram, on TikTok, I'm at Earth2KB, E-A-R-T-H-T-O-K-B. I've heard because of my accent, people think it's Earth, like E-A-R-F. And I'm like, it's Earth. Like, that's just how you say it. But anyway, uh, so Earth2KB on all of those things. I'd love to be connected with y'all. Um, this book, um, is for sale anywhere you get books. Um, a couple of local places that it's at, um, Black Pearl Books, woo woo, um, Book Woman, Malvern Books, The Little Gay Shop, literally every indie bookstore. Um, I intentionally made sure that it was copies there. Monkey Wrench Books, um, I feel like I'm forgetting, Book People, that's about it. There's six of them. I'm, I'm working on getting it at Vintage Bookstore, but they just opened like three weeks ago. That's the only reason why it's not there, but yeah, yeah. Um, oh, also I have a newsletter. It's called Out of This World. I'm really going with the space theme and all my stuff. Um, and on the newsletter, I just say like um, stuff I have coming up. Uh, it's like where I also like post like essays, um, really short, uh, readable stuff. It's like ruminations on like America, I guess, and like what is happening in the world. Um, I have a book, um, another book that is gonna open for pre-orders pretty soon. I can't tell you when, um, it's top secret, but um, <laughs> it's another book of poems. Um, it's a longer book of poems. Um, my goal for it is um, for it to get banned. Um, it's <laughs> it's like also about place Texas. Mm -hmm. um, that poem that you mentioned earlier, "Good Grief," mm -hmm. is in it. Um, I'm talking about like abortion. I'm talking about gentrification. I'm talking about like a lot of these socially charged things. It's called Freedom House. Um, it's about like how do we get systemic and personal freedom? Um, and my personal freedom kind of has been happening through transition. So it's kind of talking about transitioning. Um, also talking about, you know, Texas politics, um, and also talking about how we can get like interpersonal freedom in our relationships. So follow me if you want to know more about it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to be just a walking target really with this next book. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, well, I, for one, am looking forward to it. Um, so we do have a question um, online from Lisa Olstein, um, who writes, thank you both so much for this wonderful conversation. My question is about the intersection of form in poetry and political justice work in poetry. You spoke so movingly, KB, to your commitment to both. Form as a way of shaping the reader's experience and expanding language, your freedom in it, and a political aspect being inherent to your work, potentially to all art. Can you speak specifically to the intersection, um, intersections that you're making? Uh, LOL, hey, um, Professor Olstein. Um, <laughs> like one of my teachers. Okay, um, I, 
it's like a million ways I can answer this. I'm trying to just go through the Rolodex. Um, so the specific ways I'm trying to um, make those intersections happen is first thinking about a book is not just like paper and not just like things that exist on a page. Like I'm trying to be on stages and I'm trying to think less of stages as just like bookstores and universities. Mm -hmm. Like I will go to a K-12 school. I intentionally like with the tour I went on, like tried to go to these kind of venues that people don't think about when they think of a book tour. Like I went to a couple of LGBT centers. I went to um, some like uh, social justice uh, organizations and collectives. I. I don't know, did a birthday party. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm just like, wherever you will let me read poems, I will read them. Um, I've done some bars, like it is what it is, you know? And I think I'm doing a bad job when only poets read my work. Mm -hmm. Like I want people that do not write poetry to mm -hmm. also read my poems, right? That's most of the world, despite what <laughs> poets want you to think. Um, so it's like, if I'm talking about like, oh, I want black people to be free, oh, I want X, Y, and Z, well, I have to actually do the work as an author to make sure that the, that the book gets in hands, and not just hands of people that agree with me either, you know? Um, I didn't just think about public libraries when placing this book, though it is in Austin Public Library, it's also in a couple university libraries, like at uh, Texas Christian University, which is my alma mater. Um, you know anything about TCU? It's like 80% white there. So I'm very interested to see how these poems is hidden there. Um, it's at uh, UT Library. So, I mean, really I just incorporated like, for lack of better words, like hustling to get the book in as many places as possible um, into the book's birthing, right? Like I didn't just like write it out. So like had to be a steward of, of poetry mm -hmm. as well as like a steward of this individual book. Um, and also thinking politically um, with that poem, Good Grief, um, I also did a thing um, with some friends called the Winter Storm Project. So Winter Storm Project is an <laughs> anthology that Jazz, my friend, um, did the cover for. Um, great visual artist and great poet and great disability justice organizer, my friend Jazz. Um, <laughs> and also, yeah, uh, that was an anthology of people in Austin's like experiences of the winter storm. Um, and they uh, contributed through photography, poetry, essays. Like it was a really lush um, collection, which I wish I had funding to continue to do that. Um, <laughs> just, just dropping that in the, in the chat. Um, but yeah, thinking about like, and all of the proceeds for that, um, we sold a hundred copies. Mm -hmm. All of the proceeds for it went to um, organizations working to, you know, make climate justice in Texas happen. Um, so Poder, a really amazing organization locally. Uh, Go Austin, Vamos Austin, Basta. Um, so we like split all the proceeds three ways, gave it to them. Um, so there are ways in which to incorporate and like kind of decenter yourself as 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 a writer. Right. And like think about the writing and the ways that it can move through the world. Um, and also think about like I've also, you know, read at political rallies before, like poems. Um, when you think about protests, um, I don't know any protest that doesn't have a chant. You know, I don't know any protest that mm -hmm. doesn't have uh, speakers. When we're thinking of speakers for protests, like think about poets. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm down. I, I really am down to like read my poems really anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I want them to exist in a political sphere as well as like a literary sphere. Um, so those are some intersections that I personally have made. Um, I want to in the future like incorporate or like bring the poems into other mediums. So like museum work um, and like actually having them, you know, display like uh, what would a what would a greetings from Fort Worth, Texas look like as a painting? Or like, what would it look like as an installation um, of like a, a living room? So like Freedom House, right? It's like a house. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm just like, I'm really interested in like how I can make the poems not just poems. Like, what else can they be? Could they be film? Could they be like some other kind of digital media? Um, I don't have the skill set to make the film part happen, but 
I'm interested in those things, right? Um, and I think that serves a political purpose because it just expands access. Like access is like a policy political issue. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm also not trying to like write poems that people don't understand. So like that's a that's the thing I think about a lot. I'm like, let me give this to like my best friend, or let me give this to like uh, a family member, and like they tell me like, does this make sense? You know, mm -hmm. maybe not like every single thing, but like, is it readable? Right. You know, mm -hmm. by the yeah. audience that I claim to have. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a political decision, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. um, who do you want to be your audience, and what do you want them to get from it? Like, I'd love people to read this and, like, learn something about themselves or, like, have a conversation with somebody in their, in their, um, in their community or, you know, uh, donate proceeds to a black trans-led organization. There are lots of them. So, yeah. Thank you. One last call in the room, and I'm going to check in online just to make sure we don't Leave anyone? So uh, there's a question. Um, uh, so um, from uh, Kale, I think. Yes, um, hey, KB, Kale. when is your next book coming out? But maybe, <laughs> maybe we need to subscribe to your newsletter to yeah. find out when your next book is coming out. I'm going to tell y'all because y'all in here. Don't tell nobody. No, I'm kidding. You can tell anybody. I want people to buy the book. OK. Um, so my next book is coming out like officially um, April 2023. Okay. Um, it opens for pre-order soon. I cannot say when, but it will open for pre-order soon. The book cover is really cute. You should follow me to like learn more about it. But yeah. Thank you. And um, to close on the topic of future work, um, mm. you also list um, Pretty, mm. uh, which uh, will be coming out with Alfred A. Knopf. Mm. Um, so is that another poetry collection? Are those essays? Tell us mm. a little bit more so we know, um, you know that we'll be able to engage with your work even beyond April 2023. Yes, um, so Pretty, which, uh, Knopf, um, a really like dream um, publisher, very happy to be working with them. It's what the kids call a hybrid memoir, right? Okay. So it's like loosely about me. Um, I'm really scared of the idea of like touring with a book and being like, like me. <laughs> um, essentially, that's what you have to do with a memoir. But um, it's a hybrid memoir, which means like not going to be as straightforward as like maybe what uh, you would think of as a memoir. I think it's very like mixed genre. Okay. Um, so. I can't say too much else about it yet. Um, I'm technically still writing it, but it's a good book, I think. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that'll come out in 2024. Um, and yeah, just literally, you know, stay tuned. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. So um, thank you so much, KB Brookins. Um, thank you all to our audience um, here. Uh, in person, to our audience online, earth2kb.com uh, for uh, more information um, and take care and be well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.